Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute, we're going to review one of our foundational single leg exercises, and that is the K-Box Split Squat. Just like with the squat, guys, make sure you got that tether taunt when you're at full extension, and set yourself a counterbalance. Here we're going to use the barbell on the rack. Sink it down just like a regular split squat, chest tall, and drive through that front foot. I really like that back plate there to take tension off that back toe. As we progress forward, that's going to be big time to help us even keep our weight forward more. As we increase intensity and decrease volume, we're also typically cutting depth, therefore increasing transfer when we're looking at stopping power at a greater height. Guys, give this one a shot. I'm sure that this is one that you're going to find some great carryover for your athletes. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you can find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over 100 different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and discussing training and programming principles with Youngstown State University's Jake Tura. After a quick rundown of how we got up to Youngstown, Jake's going to dive right into how a meeting with a the soccer coach up there at YSU really got him to look at training differently. Uh, after we get in, get through that, he starts sharing with us, you know, how the questions from these coaches that he gets to work with have led to some of these major alterations that he's made, not just with how he trains athletes, but how he actually views the programming process. I then shares with us, you know, how this idea of using isometrics came to fruition and, and what he has seen with it and how he believes it's improving the biological outputs of his athletes. You know, and then we finish off guys talking about, you know, the role and reasoning of intensity of training and, and where the impact is in the mental aspect of his programming and training with the athletes he gets to work with. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Jake, thanks so much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, you too, man. What's up? Not too much, man. I'm really stoked to get this down. Having a little talk before, kind of getting the wheels turning. I'm fired up to get this down. But, you know, let's let everybody know, like, what, you know, where are you at? What are you getting into? And how'd you get up there down to uh, to Youngstown? Yeah, so uh, my name's Jake Tura. I'm an assistant strength coach at Youngstown State University. So uh, let's see. I went back to, like, college for about two years. I didn't know have any clue what I was doing with my life. And then I started lifting. Then I got into uh, training. I mean, training uh, athletes, and whatnot. Um, I kind of realized I want to be a strength conditioning coach, and for some reason, I was like, I was set on college. So uh, I was up in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, uh, that area, growing up, and then um, did my undergrad, uh, did my masters. I interned at University of Minnesota with uh, Cal Dietz and uh, some other strength coaches there at the time. Uh, and then it's like you get out with all the degrees and certifications, and you realize it's not that easy to get a job. Um, but then I was lucky I got a job at University of Minnesota Duluth, which is a Division II uh, back where, I, where I, I'm from. Uh, I was there for about a year, and then I just applied all over the place, and I got hired at uh, Youngstown State. So I've been here for about uh, two years, a little bit over two years. Um, and I just have – I mean, I have a bunch of teams. But, uh, yeah, that's what I'm, what I'm doing now. That's uh, kind of how I got here. Oddly enough, that's a lot of hockey background. Superior, Duluth, Minnesota. Like that's uh, that's an interesting triad of like hockey areas in this country. 
Yeah. And you know what? I'm i I mean, I grew up a basketball guy. I've always loved basketball and they're kind of opposing uh, sports cause it's kind of the same, uh, time frame uh, for the season. But, uh, yeah, you know what? I didn't, I didn't even know. I don't even really know how to skate. Uh, but yeah, working with, uh, the, the hockey guys, girls at Minnesota was pretty awesome. I didn't do anything with Minnesota Duluth. They were really separate. Their strength program with hockey was really separate from uh, the Olympic side, but, uh, yeah, quite a bit of hockey, but I've always been a, I've always been a basketball guy. That's awesome, man. That's actually the opposite. I was always I was a hockey player growing up, and now working in basketball. So it's just funny how all these things seem cyclical. But yeah. you're doing some pretty pretty interesting stuff up there in Ohio. Let's kind of talk about where these ideas have come from and, and how you've kind of built your way out with it. Yeah. So, I mean, when I so when I first got hired here, um, I mean that was a big thing for me. Division one job. Um, like pretty cool your ego boost whatever all your all your friends are like oh you're division one you big time whatever um but that lasted for me for like like a month and then i'm like all right this is it like i need to i need to continue pushing myself so um i just i bought a ton of books i started reading like uh i don't know game like game changer strength coordination um a lot of these strength and conditioning books um and then like one by 20 uh there were many others but um yeah so then i started applying all these things in the training i had uh, and then actually what happened was our women's soccer program, we got, we hired a new coach. Um, and this guy, he had been a strength coach in the past. So I went in to meet with him and I went off talking about what I do as a strength coach, you know, like I'm going to do this one by 20 using all this jargon strength in the strength world, you know, like, uh, strength, endurance, whatever physiological terms I want to use. Um, and he was like, dude, like we're trying to put the ball in the back of the net, you know? <laughs> um, and prevent the other team from doing the same. And I just didn't get it. You know, I didn't understand. It's like, um, but when you're so entrenched in the strength world and you're so zoomed in on everything, um, I, I think a lot of strength coaches don't have the ability to zoom out. Um, so I had this meeting with, with a head coach who like, I'm supposed to be going in being a staff member, supporting him to put the ball in the back of the net and prevent the other team from doing the same. Um, and I just couldn't understand it. So, uh, that was kind of around the time I was reading Game Changer too. So it was taking this thing of like starting with the game instead of starting with uh, strength and conditioning. Um, but yeah, after that meeting, I, I this was around winter time. I went home and I was just like, man, I don't know how it's going to work out with women's soccer. Um, I don't, I don't see eye to eye with this guy at all. But um, then over enough, over enough time of talking with him, whatever, we kind of found some common ground, and I kind of realized the uh, my, the, the paradigm that I had in my head was was really wrong. Um, uh, the way of looking at training athletes, uh, because uh, ultimately you're like, if you're basketball, you're trying to put the ball in the hoop, you know, you're trying to squat more weights, you know, trying to, these things can help, but it's like, you got to start with the, the main objective. So, um, we had that. And then I, uh, he kind of recently, uh, recommended reading anti-fragile and or the book anti-fragile. And that's really, uh, really, uh, changed my mindset in a lot of things that I do as a strength coach, just questioning, uh, questioning a lot more, like, why do we do these things? You know? And I think that that's probably the most important question that we never ask ourselves. Yeah. And, and you know, now uh, I, I was just reading uh, uh, James Smith's book, uh, Global, uh, whatever, that, whatever that book is called. I'm not sure the title. Um, but he was saying how, how the strength field, what is it, like 100 years old or something like this? Not even that. And it's like when you look at it that way, it's like, man, like – we are so, we don't know really anything yet. We have all these, these things that we think you need to do this. And we will talk down on, on sport coaches and be like, they're, they're doing this stupid drill. They're doing this and this, this It's like, well, they've existed for a lot longer than we have. So why, why should we question these things? Um, and that's, that's kind of one of the concepts in anti-fragile, which is like the, the things that have, have lasted, uh, the test of time are probably more rights than the things that are new. Um, so, that's something I've, I've had to accept of like, sure. I have all this knowledge and whatnot, but it's like, maybe there are things that are happening that I don't, we can't explain from a strength and conditioning perspective. Um, but yeah, they, they just question, you know what, questioning a lot more and not like trying to question the actual paradigm that you have in your head. Um, which then lead to all of the methods that you're using, which is like, maybe it's wrong in the first place, you know? Well, right. Because it is such a, a new and novel concept having an individual train athletes, you know, coming from the idea that the coaches were doing this all themselves. Um, having these unique ideas, though, is something that's kind of starting to set you apart. 
Yeah, it's uh, you know, and I and I owe a lot of credit to our our uh, my the soccer coach I work with um, because he a very very smart guy um, and really trying to turn the program around because our our soccer program has not been successful in the past, um, but. Yeah, he's kind of led me down these paths just to be like, um, we get we get way too zoomed in, um, and we I think we need to zoom out and we need to get things from other perspectives. Um, I was talking about all these books I was reading in the strength world, and one thing he's like, stop reading strength conditioning books, read books from other fields, like so you can actually connect things. Um, otherwise, you get you get way too zoomed in. That's all you know. That's all you all you see performance, and it's like, can you really relate to athletes when? you're just the strength guy in the weight room and they're the one going and doing their sport. Um, even like, uh, like swimmers, you know, I work with the swim team here and it's like, I think often we'll, uh, strength coaches, cause we're used to the intensity of the weight room, you know, lifting heavy weights, jumping on boxes or whatever we do. Um, we won't, we would, it's hard to relate to swimmers, especially distant swimmers. And we might just be like, Oh, they're just weird, you know, or, or they're soft. They don't want to lift heavy or whatever. It's like, well, what if we got in the pool? You know, I go in the pool and I swim like, uh, one tenth of what they do. And my freaking triceps hurt, <laughs> you know, like I, I can't even function. And it's like, uh, how do we really relate to these athletes if we're, we're not trying to put ourselves in their shoes? Right. So then how now has that brought about some alterations to your training methodology? Yeah. So, um, it's kind of been less, uh, less of them like coming in and, and me being like, all right, I have all the knowledge. I have all the solutions. You need me to be your strength coach. I'm going to make you so much better to them coming in and maybe being like, let's see where you're at now. And let's, I mean, let's just like slowly try to make progress over time. Instead of like, I have all the answers. Here's all this training you need to do high intensity, high volume. Um, it's more just like, like, I guess seeking to understand before being like, uh, I have, I have so much knowledge, you know, I have the key. It's, it's the back squad. It's the periodization plan. It's whatever. It's like, well, like, sure, there are benefits to this, but what are the potential negatives of me taking this? And I think a lot of the negatives, um, if we talk about how I've changed uh, the things that I do, is really just, uh, I think, minimizing volume, um, doing a lot less than I had done in the past. Um, because I think, uh, let's take soccer, for example, like uh, college soccer, they come in and they may, maybe they have 10 days, two weeks, uh, at least in my setting, maybe they have one, two weeks before their first game. Um, and, and a strength conditioning coach might take these athletes who have, haven't lifted in, I don't know, they maybe, maybe they haven't lifted all summer. And it's like, here's what we're doing. We're going to do the, the Nordics for uh, hamstring injury prevention. And we're going to do squats and deadlifts and split squats, whatever. And yeah, we know that these can reduce the likelihood of injury, but if you're taking them and they haven't been used to this stuff, you're probably increasing the likelihood of injury because you're, they're just going to get blown up. They're going to be super sore. Um, so uh, what I've taken with all these concepts is just like, do, <laughs> do less, take away things. Don't, don't think you need to add more. Like right now, for example, with, with soccer, um, they, we lift twice a week, maybe once. And our lower body exercise is a zercher squat and a trap bar deadlift. And those are the only two exercises we do for lower body. Um, like we could argue, Oh, we need to add in split squats. We need to add in lateral lunges. We need to add in this and this and this. It's like, do we need to do all of this stuff, you know, or is this just going to make them worse? You know, or how do we know that they're actually recovering well enough? Um, and, and you know what, we do throw in some isometrics too. Um, like on like more recovery type days, like not even that long duration, maybe 15, 30 seconds or something. But, um, yeah. So how I've kind of changed is like, what, <laughs> what am I doing now and what can I take away? Uh, and I think that's kind of where I'm at now. No, what, what are you doing and what are you going to take away? Like, it's just a completely and totally mind opening thought process. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Like, um, I think you, you have to get rid of the ego. Um, because, uh, I think in this field, the strength field, like there are, there are not many jobs. Um, and don't, you can get all the certifications and, and degrees and, um, like you're still not going to get a job. It's like a lot of it is who, you know, and I, I understand because if I'm going to, if I'm going to hire, if I'm going to hire someone, I'm probably going to hire my friend or someone that I trust can come in and do this. So, um, it, it does seem like you hire, you get GAs in or you get assistants come in and it's like, they have to prove themselves, you know, like they feel like I have to prove myself, I have to prove my knowledge, I have to show that I'm smart, whatever. And it's like, um, so then, then we get in the point where it's like, I think we're adding volume, we're adding intensity, we're adding all these crazy exercises and stuff. And it's like, man, is that, is that really where it's at? Or maybe it's about like, you, you take a team and can you actually connect with these people? Can you actually work with them? Um, and then slowly try to make progress over time. Um, but if you're, if you're training them, like you're trying to prove yourself, uh, because 
there's no jobs. Um, and you, you're doing all this crazy stuff and they're just going in the training room all banged up and injured. It's like, maybe we need to uh, rethink things. And I mean, I've definitely went through stuff like that. So those are, those are the, those are the signs where it's like, um, Hey, am I doing things right or not? <laughs> um, and, and hopefully you have people around you that you can connect with who can actually challenge you and you're able to listen. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, like Fergus talks about it quite often with everything he does, like that listening aspect is what's so important to being able to sculpt what you're actually doing. Yeah. And man, uh, it can be tough when, when your only lens is, uh, strength and conditioning, um, and you don't see things through any other scope. So, so even having those, like those four quadrants in his book, um, and I know that's been covered in, in many other books, but like the, uh, the physical, psychological, tactical, technical, that was something that opened, like for me, I I'd been in this for so long, even, even reading that in this book about two years ago, I had never even heard of this. And it was like, I had been so far into my, into the physical development that I wasn't even aware of these other things. Um, and that they, that they actually were important. Cause I was just like, man, let's squat more weight. Let's jump higher. Let's sprint faster. You'll be a better athlete. And it's like, well, maybe, but <laughs> that's not everything that goes into it. No, but you are putting in some new ish. Can we call them new? Some let's call it reinvented things to help those athletes with those biological outputs. Uh, yeah. What meaning what the big impact of the ISOs that you've been talking about of what? Oh yeah. 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 So, um, you know what, that kind of came from, um, where this, cause I, I've suffered with jumpers knee before, um, patellar tendonitis. So actually if we, if we talk about, um, I, me kind of stepping out of the strength world being like, all right, what is my role? Um, it's not what I thought it was at first. Uh, do, do you even need this position as a strength conditioning coach? I mean, I know J- James Smith argues, like if you have a head coach who's competent and everything, um, do you even, do you even need these positions at certain levels or can they take care of it themselves? But what I, what I'm looking at is like, if we say like, uh, let's go back to what has existed bas- Let's say the sport of basketball, when the f- sport of basketball came out, there was no strength conditioning and people got pretty good at basketball without strength conditioning. Um, so it's like, if you want to get better at basketball, play the freaking sport of basketball. That's all there is to it. Um, but then we can run into, let's say some type of uh, soft tissue injuries or maybe jumpers there or something like that. Um, and this is a time where I think the strength conditioning field has, its, has its, most of its merit because it can reduce the likelihood of someone getting hurt. Um, because when you play the sport, it's just, uh, basketball, is, for example, like it's very high velocity. You're just, you're, you're, you're cutting, you're jumping, you're sprinting. Um, like your muscle, your muscles not really getting trained that much in terms of a strength, uh, strength perspective. And your tendons are just getting very stiff. And that, that jumper's knee tendon, um, the patellar tendon, it's not really going to heal if you just play basketball over and over and have these high velocity, um, uh, high, high velocity movements. So you get in the weight room and if you just lift heavy, uh, I've had a lot of athletes that, uh, they have jumpers and I'm like, Hey, just start squatting heavy, right. Uh, start squatting heavy. And a few weeks later, their, their jumpers knees are gone or it's improved a lot. But the, the main thing is you squat heavy, you're moving slow. Um, so you could just do an isometric hold and you, you're actually just, that muscle is not that, that muscle is getting under a lot of tension, but that tendon can actually relax and it can actually get healthy again. Um, so I think that's where I think personally right now, cause I don't work with football, football probably quite a bit different because of the physical demands of that sport and the more isolated nature, because there's a, a line of scrimmage and the plays are so short and you can coaches can really intervene. I think you can really work on like, sprint mechanics, cutting mechanics and, and see that transfer more so than maybe a sport like soccer or basketball, where there's a lot more chaotic and the athletes just kind of have to go out and play. Um, but if I can do something automatic to hopefully keep these athletes healthier, um, and if that's isometrics, if that's just lifting heavy, um, so that their muscle gets stronger and their tendon can kind of, uh, like get healthier. I think that's the, the biggest, uh, aspect of, of my job is the injury reduction piece. I love that too, man, because you're also not talking about a huge amount of CNS stress or really like overall stress from the situation. You're just kind of setting yourself in and you're doing what you got to do and moving on. Yeah. And, and, and again, maybe this is, maybe this is a level we're at like mid major D one, but it's like, uh, if I do high CNS stress, right. I really want to fatigue someone. It's like in, in the weight room, it's like, I, okay. I do that, but I really pick those times. Like, I think I had one day that was like a sled workout with women's basketball, which really sucked. Um, uh, but this was on a Friday where they had Saturday off. They had Sunday off. Monday was going to be easy. Tuesday was going to be easy. And then I think they practiced on Wednesday, but it's like, 
Um, I'll still throw those in because there are benefits to having those like maybe high CNS, high lactic, whatever type workouts. Um, but I always err on the side of caution. Cause it's like, you never know how much sleep, uh, unless, unless you're actually tracking this, and, unless you're tracking this daily and the athletes are able to be honest with you. Um, which I, I think I have about a hundred athletes right now. So if there is tracking that's happening, it's usually going to be by more so by the, uh, sport coaches themselves, um, or maybe athletic trainers. Um, I, I do a little bit of it, but I mean, I just, uh, I would just say it's, it's just too tough right now to get there and then get honest feedback. But if you don't know if they're sleeping enough or they're, what they're eating or what's going on in their life, um, like I think erring on the side of caution is probably best. So if I'm, if I'm taking them in and I'm just destroying their CNS, it's like, I don't think it's the best thing to do. I think they're going to run into injuries over time. And we do know, like, I mean, you're a one by 20 guy. It's like, it's, it's pretty easy to get these athletes strong, especially if they went home and into anything all summer. It's like you're getting a new athlete every single, every uh, single semester. So it's like, why not go more on the low volume, uh, lower intensity side and just slowly make them stronger over time. Obviously I couldn't agree more <laughs> with yeah. what you just said, but I've got devil's advocate questions. Yeah. One of which will be the second one I get asked all the time, um, so I might get a little butt hurt even asking it. Um, but the first one is one that I haven't been asked and one that I haven't even thought of until right now. Both of us being people that are more at the mid-major level, right? Do you think that that might have more to play into the fact that we are able to get these adaptations with these lower stress levels? Or do you feel that it's just something that really across the board, um, athletes at this age level that we get to work with really don't necessarily need that high of a stress level for the adaptations we want to occur? Yeah. Um, So I don't know if this is going to answer it, but this is the one thing that I think of um, is if we take uh, like – I work with women's basketball, I work with women's soccer, and I go back and I said women's soccer hasn't been very successful uh, in the past. Uh, women's basketball has had quite a bit more success. Um, but I look at the training I'm able to do with the two teams, and on the soccer side, like there, we do fit for 90, so we do track soreness, uh, fatigue levels, whatnot. Um, I just think, and talking with coach too, like we just think they cannot genetically they can't handle the they can't handle high volume they can't handle high intensity um versus with the the basketball team i work with um i've been able to push them quite a bit um and it seems like they've been able to uh respond pretty well i mean meaning we haven't had uh, a ton of injuries or we haven't had um the uh, big issues but i i think uh I, I don't know the answer to that um there's obviously a ton of variables and probably variables within the athletes themselves where you might have one athlete who you can just destroy um, and they'll respond well. And the other one you destroy and they're, they're done. For, they're, they're out of commission for like a week, you know, um, I don't know the answer, but um, the stuff with like uh, Christian Thibodeau's neurotyping, that's definitely been some interesting stuff. I haven't paid any money for it, um, but I've listened to a lot of like podcasts and people talk about it. And even looking at individually within athletes, like I know, I know one of our, our post players, she's, she's an athlete who wants to get, have like a lactic response from training. She wants to do more, um, like high rep, like burnout type stuff. She, if I do like a CN, a, a day of like potentiation for CNS or something, like she doesn't really feel like there's been any training done at all versus another girl, like one of our point guards. If I do that with her, I know she's just going to be dead for a few days. Um, if I do a high lactic workout. So, um, I don't know, like, I think it, it, it varies within the athletes, but yeah, I, I, I guess I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you the answer to that. I don't know. No, because I don't think there is an answer, and I respect that. I think that the the answer is simply that, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? And every Jane and Joe is going to be different. Than, so figuring out how we can make that happen is what's the challenge. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess it depends if we say, like, we can get results from one by 20 or something. It's like, I guess what results are we really talking about? Um, like, is it just the maximal strength boost? Is it a, a speed and power type deal? Um and I would say, I mean, strength, I guess, uh, is fairly easy to build. Um, uh, but like strength and power measures, like if you're whatever level you're at, I think it depends on your coach, uh, what your coach is doing. Like if your coach wants to destroy them all year by conditioning them for, I don't know, 10 hours a week, it's like, good luck with your, uh, p- uh power speed numbers, because that's not going to happen regardless of what, what system you're running. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I guess I don't know the, a lot of variables. 
thousand percent, bro. Now then, I guess my next question, this is one that might actually get me fired up. Um, for people that sit here and say that that only works because you're basically resting them and that we're, we're contributing to them being soft. What's your reply to that? Uh, in terms of like low volume approach? In terms of, yeah, the minimal effective dose, if we can still call it that. Is it, is it still cool to call it that? I don't know. Like that's what we call it. <laughs> that's what us old heads called it. And we were like really yeah. the cool kids. And now I, I don't know if they'll let me in the, the same lunchroom, let alone uh, at the cool kid table anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the, I mean, the whole mental toughness argument is like, uh, something I don't necessarily believe in. Um, but I do think, so I, I, I know like James Smith has said mental toughness doesn't even exist or whatever, but I'm like, I, I personally don't think we can just say it doesn't exist when so many people use it and it's going to be used over and over anyways. Um, I think you need a replacement. Um, and I think the replacement is if we just say like mental toughness and we ask this team, what do you think mental toughness means? And let's say there's 30 athletes. I think you get 30 different replies. So it's like, what is the point of using a term when there's 30 different interpretations of the term? Um, why, if we had a term that said score the ball in the basket, you get 30 people, they all know what that means. Um, so that's an effect. That's a term that's actually useful. Um, so the term, uh, and I've talked a lot with our, our, uh, women's soccer coach. He actually kind of got me on this about, the whole mental toughness thing, he looks at it more of a brain, like the brain, like the brain is a muscle and either, you, either you train the brain or you don't train the brain. Um, and if you talk about mental toughness, all you really want out of the athlete is for them to think of their task, think of their work whenever they're doing it. So like if they're playing in a basketball game and they're down by 20 points, you want them to think of their next action, whatever that is playing defense, playing offense. Um, if you're able to actually think of your task, then we, a coach would say, Oh, you're mentally tough. Um, I, I would think at least, um, but it's really just, what is your job and think of your job. Don't think of the external factors. Don't think, Oh, my knee hurts or, Oh, this player did this to me or, Oh, this and this happened in the past, but thinking of your next action. Um, so if we just say mental toughness is, is stupid and useless, then I don't think we're going to do any training that actually challenges the brain. And we're just going to do minimal effective dose type stuff. Um, versus let's say that does exist and we need to challenge yourself to think of the task. I mean, we could do a number of things. Um, a lot of those could be more conditioning days. Like I was talking about the, that lactic, like sled workout we did where now you challenge your brain to be like, think of the task you're doing. Um, instead of thinking of, Oh, my legs hurt so bad, you know? Um, so getting, I guess getting in those type of situations, but I also think it's context dependent because it's like, if you're a mentally tough, uh, and then now I'm, Sorry, I'm using the term <laughs> off and on, but I hope you get what I mean. Um, if your brain is trained, let's say, as a uh, Marine or something to go and kill someone while people are trying to kill you and you can focus on your task, does that now mean if you're standing at the free throw line and you're down by one and time's expired, you got to sink a free throw, are you going to have the, the – the, is the brain going to be able to focus on the task there? Like I don't think so. I think it depends on – like I guess there probably would be some carryover, but it's like you have to train in the actual manner you're, you're given. And for us as strength coaches – if we're working with basketball, we can't use a basketball, uh, based on our like NCAA regulations, you know? So if we all mental toughness, I guess you got to recruit it in, um, or coaches, I don't know, <laughs> find some ways to replicate that in, in your own training, the very sport specific way. Yeah. I think that I really love Hank Krasenhoff's definition of it. And that is trusting in your training. Yeah. In terms of, uh, the, the brain aspect. Yeah, the whole mental toughness idea. Like if you believe in what you've done and you're prepared for what you're getting into, you probably look like you're more mentally tough because you're prepared. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, – I think that was in the the movie with Denzel Washington. I'm not sure what it was, but uh, they said the, – this girl said something about being tough and he said there's no toughness. It's trained and untrained. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I – but you know what? Like I think there's some athletes, uh, especially – what. what we're given 18, 19, 20 year olds. Like, I mean, you can just tell, like if some of them don't want to be there, it's like, you can do all the training in the world you want. Like they're still going to, they're still going to look mentally weak or something, but it's like, is it a, is it a mental weakness or is it that they just sincerely don't want to play the sport? <laughs> um, so maybe they shouldn't be playing. Yeah. And I think that there's also, like you said, that with the other answer, it's so multifactorial. Like if it's a kid who every time they missed a free throw when they were growing up, daddy freaking took them out back and cussed them out and made them shoot another thousand free throws and told them how bad they are. 
Well, yeah, of course this kid's pissing down his leg when it's time to go do this, right? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously this is an exceptionally extreme example that I, I mean, you know, but there are things that lead to these actions. And I don't think as much as we would like to believe that if you can get a kid to do 21 reps instead of 20 or you can get a kid to push a prowler eight times instead of seven – that all of a sudden their late game free throw percentage is going to go from 45 to 95 percent. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, I know. We just don't know. Um, I mean, I've even I heard a like. It, I think it's the way we we see things. The strength coaches we we are like you need to be able to do this. Let's say you need to be able to do a three minute iso lunge, and that shows our mental toughness or something. You know, like I think these things are just stupid, and and I think you need trying to understand if you have a team of 15 athletes, like they have 15 different perceptions of what mental toughness is or what their brain being trained is. And maybe in the, the ways we're training them, like in the weight room or on the track or on a hill or something, maybe they see no connection of this whatsoever to like being able to push through in their, in the sport. And maybe you never see a weakness on when they have a basketball in their hands. I mean, we just don't know. It's like, uh, I understand that maybe there is some correlation with everything you do in life. Like, like we say, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Like I've, I've heard of that and I can, I can, I can understand, but I, I also disagree <laughs> um, that there are some things that I just, people just don't enjoy doing and they're not going to do the same matter as something that they do enjoy doing. And they can be very successful at the thing they're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I, just, I just don't know. Right. And I also think we would probably both agree that there are times where these kids pushing themselves to a point that they haven't pushed themselves to in the past is important because they've never done it. So maybe they don't know. Maybe there are some kids, again, and this is completely individualized. This is not me saying every single kid needs to get blown up in the gym every now and then. I'm just saying that there are some people who have never been asked to push, who have never been asked to do more, who have never been asked to do, period. And maybe some of these quote-unquote harder workouts actually do teach them that, comma, they're probably not as necessarily needed as often as we would like to think at times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think think it's like you look at the – if you're doing that stuff and it's going to be like a lactic type thing, like – uh, what are the, what are the effects going to be afterwards? Um, and if you, I mean, if you even do that, I don't know, once, once a summer or something, like I think for me, I only did it once this summer, uh, one time this summer with women's basketball, mainly because they play basketball, like so many hours all week. There wasn't really an off season. And I never want to put them on the court being when I know they're, they're have some accumulated fatigue from what I did or chronic, like too much fatigue. Um, but yeah, I think, I think doing those things, I think athletes want that too. I think a lot of them on the team feel like they want something like that for whatever reason, maybe they see it in the media or they see something, but it's like, I think it's kind of giving them a little bit of what they want. Um, even if it does suck super bad, but I think us too, like, uh, for me, like or as strength coaches, like if, if we also like have some skin in the game and we do that type of stuff too. Um, so like the thing was like, if I do, if I do a really tough workout with someone, my thing is I make sure I do it beforehand. So like if I make them push the sled for 30, 40, 50 minutes, you know, like 30 seconds on, take a bunch of rest. So I get it really, uh, really lactic. I'm going to make sure I did it beforehand too. So that there's not this, dis- this disconnect where I'm standing on the side yelling at them to push this freaking sled. And they're probably thinking in their brains, like, why don't you push this sled? Um, so I think trying to put yourself in their shoes and, and go through what they go through. I think, I think that helps, uh, like get rid of that disconnect. Thousand percent. I couldn't agree anymore. But Jake, let me get you out of here with this, man. You put out a lot of really awesome content and things that you know are going to help coaches understand a little bit better what you're trying to do with the young men and women that you get to work with. Where can they follow you, man? Where can they see more of what you got cooking? Yeah, so it's mainly uh, my Instagram is Jake Tura. Uh, Jake, my last name is T U U R A, um, and then my website is JackAthlete.com, um, which uh, for me personally is like I my own training, I care about, uh, getting jacked. And then I care about doing athletic things and lifting, lifting heavy weights. So I kind of went back and forth with those in my, in my past, but it's kind of like putting everything together to how can we, op- how can we attempt to optimize, uh, muscle gain, athletic performance, um, and strength gain all at once. Um, uh, but yeah, my Instagram is where I post a lot of stuff. Uh, another thing too, is like, 
uh, in, in, I post a lot of, uh, not too much, but, um, with the training I do with teams, a lot of it is like the stupid games I play. So if people, uh, strength coaches need some ideas on warmups because dynamic warmups get pretty monotonous and boring. Um, sometimes I just, uh, I take the spike ball net out or I, I set up this net and I play B12 volleyball or med ball tennis or stuff like that. So going back to the Fergus Connolly thing, you know, working like tactics, technique, whatever, in a very nonspecific way, it's just like. It's psycho, like psychological stuff too. I think it's just trying to trying to get some flow state within these athletes because a lot of them don't don't love training. So, um, yeah, my Instagram kind of uh, I think covers all this stuff. Awesome, brother. We'll make sure we got that in the notes. Jake, truly appreciate your time, man. This is sensational. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch real soon, brother. Thank you. Yep. And a huge thanks to Youngstown State's Jake Turo for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing from a man who's really getting it done and, and has had really an, a great open mind in order to impact on his athletes at a better level. Jake, I can't thank you enough for being so open, honest, and candid today with us with your sharing. This is absolutely awesome stuff. And guys, make sure you hop over to jackedathlete.com to check out what he's got out there. And, and seriously, give him a follow. J-A-K-E-T-U-U-R-A. On the gram, uh, he does. He puts out some really great content. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.